And we are back, folks, for another edition of the Michigan Recruiting Insider. I mean, every episode we do. Commitments, right? I mean, that's what it's been like lately. And so we had to save this one because we knew that Michigan, it wasn't just going to be two commits this week. We knew it was going to be three commits this week, the last of which was Jake Guarnera, who just went live, went public with his commitment to the University of Michigan. So we're going to provide analysis for all three commits this week as the Wolverines continue to press toward an outstanding class coming off of their latest trip to the college football playoff. As we get into this, I always remind you, if you like what we do, be sure to like this video. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. That way you'll get a new indicator or notification every time we do a new video. Same thing with the podcast. If you like this podcast, be sure to rate it. Be sure to review it and tell all your friends about it. That's how you keep us going and growing. But the best way to show love and support is to go over to the MichiganInsider.com. Subscribe there. One dollar gets you in your first month. Once you become a full-paying member, the world is your oyster as far as all the information and intel on Michigan football, basketball, and recruiting, all the other team sites, and Paramount Plus. Mayor of Kingstown is outstanding. A 1923, outstanding. There's some outstanding shows on Paramount Plus. If you haven't subscribed, time to get in with us over on the Michigan Insider on 24-7 Sports. Joining me as they do every single week, the best crew in the land, bar none. These guys are outstanding. They are my crew, my boys, my guys, starting with Steve Lorenz. Steve, how are you? Good. Good, guys. Yeah, good. Uh, works works pretty easy right now. A lot of good <laughs> things going on in Ann Arbor. You know, everyone's happy. I never take these stretches for granted because everyone seems to be in a good mood and happy. It makes it a lot easier to... Uh, you know, pump out content and and, and oh. discuss the uh, the program. I'm laughing because last year, I mean, some of these were brutal in the past. Like whatever. <laughs> we really had to. I don't. We really had to stretch stretch stuff out last year. Oh, oh, <laughs> scraps man. digging for scraps. Now they're <laughs> coming up with something. <laughs> yeah, it, was it, was tough. it was tough. These aren't so tough. Uh, joining us also. Our guy, Bryce Lover. Bryce Marriage, how are you? Well, solid, solid. I'm trying to recover from the voice thing. I don't know. I, and people said, oh, you're probably celebrating for that number one class. No, it's just, you know, a lot of good news, though. So it's. Yeah, uh, I hear that. I hear that. You're absolutely right. News that we saw coming, though. There's that, that pivotal visit weekend in mid-March where Jaden Davis comes to campus. And this is this is where. You convince him that that commitment that he made back in November, because now everyone knows that he committed in November, and when he came back in mid-March, he was just trying to get the visit lined up. You know, if he had got the visit for end of February, it, he would have got it cleared up then. But wasn't able to get the visit uh, until I think it was March 16th or 17th. And while he was there, saw and heard everything he needed to see and hear to, uh, you know, firm up his commitment. And then it was about getting others in the fold. And they took this now. Famous picture, Bryce, with four guys on it. Of course, you had Jaden. You had Jordan Marshall on that picture. He went live with his commitment shortly after that. And then, of course, Blake Frazier, who we started hearing rumblings about. Like, hey, he's going to move up his timeline because he word was he was ready to commit on that visit. They kind of pumped the brakes. He wound up committing here recently, as you all know. And then the other was Brady Priestcorn. And we've been talking about Brady Priestcorn for a long time. The Wolverines got them, I, I think, an outstanding. This dude is a national target right here in the state of Michigan. They effectively guarded their own yard. Huge. I mean, I think he's a top 100 uh, tight end. I've, I've seen him play football. I've seen him even play basketball. He's a lead athlete regardless of what he's doing. Um, he comes from great genes. His brother plays at Ole Miss. He recently transferred from Memphis. 6'6", 230, 235. Great frame. He can run. He can block. He plays for Rochester Adams, which mostly Sam, which I know if you've seen, yeah. they do a lot of running. So yeah, he do. doesn't get the ball thrown to him quite a bit, but he's a great offensive threat. I think he's going to be huge um, in the red zone. I This is just I, – I see the Lions stuff you got on. But this is my comparison. I see TJ Hawkinson. That's kind of where I kind of see him fitting in. And pairing him with Hogan Hansen, who's another top linebacker in the country, both in the top, uh, I think, two of the top ten uh, tight ends, I should say, 
in the country. Grant Newsom, man, the job he's done has been from just joining staff and getting elevated to the tight ends coach. He's been really impressing. This is a recruitment that's been tough to follow just because Brady doesn't talk, you know? So you didn't know what he was really doing, what he was really saying. He's been to Michigan like seven times. He recently was back up. Sam, I know you you reported he was up for um, the 23rd, 24th, and then he followed it up for another visit. So overall, though, he's a great fit. He fits what Michigan wants to do up front. He can extend plays, you know, go out, and they're going to use the tight end position. That's one of the biggest draws for him. And I think that's why ultimately it was relationships, tight end usage, and it was just close to home. And I think all that culminated to his commitment. Steve, big time. Sam, I think it was the game that you might have been at, the second one, where he was really, really impressed. I think that was the first game that was highlighted on his junior huddle. Uh, he looked really, he looked good as a sophomore, looked like a national, like a legit national prospect, but his junior stuff was like a different level. I felt like uh, he's already really, really polished as a receiver. I think the biggest thing is, uh, as is for most high school tight end prospects, is going to have to get the blocking aspect, aspect of things like figured out. But the thing with him, though, you notice <clears throat> he already play, he plays super physical, though, when he's able to get his nose in, 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 the, in the mix as far as blocking, you know, whether it's linebackers, uh, defensive backs, whatever. He's very willing. So, uh, yeah, a potential total package type kid at tight end. You know, I think when you recruit tight end, sometimes you have, yeah, you have guys that might end up looking like more like uh, primary blocker type guys, H-back style. You have other guys who are more like flex, like like you can can maybe put them, uh, spot them out a little bit, throw them the ball. He looks like a guy that is going to be able to do it all uh, by the time he goes through Ann Arbor. So, yeah, can't understate. Always nice for, for Michigan, especially nice to have like an elite prospect at a position that you, you utilize more than most programs right in your backyard. Uh, you know, just a matter of really just, you know, treating a kid like that as more than just, a, you know, we, we know you're close to home type deal. I mean, you still have to recruit the hell out of the guy. But uh, either way, you know, also, yeah, the, the quiet thing. I always just think guys like that end up doing well. Uh, it makes it harder for us to figure out what's going on. But they, you know very business-like approach in some of these situations. So uh, plus like I, the other thing is, is it, it does feel like Michigan always gets the quiet kids that, that don't talk to anybody in like every class. It's like, there's like 10 of them in every cycle. So um, not a surprise that he resonated really well with Michigan and Grant Newsom. And I, I think the thing about Grant is he has the youth. He has the intelligence like he's a very well-spoken well-studied dude like one of the smartest guys i've ever covered as a recruit and he's also enthusiastic but not like in that that really in your face enthusiastic kind of way it's much more of your like measured direct enthusiasm about about michigan about the program and about uh the tight end spot so yeah grant is going to keep recruiting top guys every cycle i feel like and uh you know prescorn being the biggest one he's reeled in so far though for sure yeah, Michigan is always going to recruit outstanding tight end targets. This is not hyperbole when I say this, but I think he is the most complete tight end prospect that Michigan has landed uh, in the past few cycles. Now, I don't think that he is, you know, he's not coasting uh, as, a, as, a, as a receiver, but he's really, really good. He's really, really good. Make no mistake, because I'll get to that coming up. But uh, he does Matt Hemner, who we'll see more of this this week or this year. Foot speed wise is on a different level, right? We saw that in the spring game. My point in bringing that up is these are guys who you had to bring along as blockers, right? Guys who were receivers, who you had to coach up in the in the blocking aspect of the game, right? Big adjustment. The blocking aspect of the game will not be an adjustment for Brady Prescorn. They get after it at Rochester Adams. You ever seen him play? I remember I told Bryce I was going. He's like, why? He was like, you aren't going to get any highlights. <laughs> he said, Bryce said, don't take your camera. He said, it won't even be worth it because they are not going to throw up the football. They run that wing tee, and your tight end is basically an extra tackle, right? So he is blocking the majority of the time uh, at Adams. But the game I went to, 
all right, you got to get it open. You're playing West Bloomfield. And so they aired it out to him. He he had a couple big touchdown receptions and some other uh, some other catches in that game. But watching him block, watching him finish blocks, watching that be a serious part of his game. And then even on defense, and I talked about this before, guys, look, he was overmatched going against Amir. Uh, you know, Amir, I remember talking to him after the game. He said, you know, I dominated. <laughs> I dominated that dude. But he kept coming. I mean, he had him. Look, he had Amir is what, 330? Amir's like 330. He's going to get the dude 230. Of course, he's going to engulf him, right? But you, what I liked about Brady was the tenacity. He kept fighting. Now, eventually, the coach thought better of it and was like, let me put Brady on the other side, right? Let's not have him going against Amir every snap. But you saw a lot about his mentality. And definitely, you saw a lot about how he, he is a blocker right now. And that's where I come with the TJ Hawkinson thing. You know, TJ Hawkinson was never going to be, is never going to be Travis Kelsey or any of the other big time pass catchers, but he is a really good receiver. But you put him in there as a blocker, and it was the complete aspect of his game that made the Lions still probably, I think, reach drafting him that early. I don't, you never draft a tight end in the first round. Never, matter of fact, never draft a tight end in the first two rounds, period. Draft your tight end third round or later. Let that be a lesson to you, GMs out there, as if you listen to us. But anyway, I digress. This guy is like TJ Hawkinson in that he plays both parts of the game really well coming in the door. This is a freshman that I highly, I think it's highly likely that he comes in the door and he's in the rotation right away, guys. So love this pickup for Michigan, a top 100 guy. You beat Ohio State, you beat Penn State, you fended off Bama, you guarded your yard. Moving on. Another guy that you wind up beating Bama for, Gerard Smith, you know, a, a young man, you know, it, whether it's when he was at Loomis, which is Lorenzetti School, now he's at Cheshire Academy, which is Cornelius Johnson School. There's been a path from that region to Michigan. Give a huge amount of props to Mike Elston, Bryce, for going in there and really building a great relationship with that young man off the rip. Big, big factor in him committing to Michigan. Yeah, he's a uh, top two, four, seven defense on lineman um, that recently came up on a visit that Michigan, Mike Elston, blew him away to the point where there was rumors and there was buzz that maybe Michigan led for him and his twin brother, Jacob Smith, who has yet to commit to any school. I know he's seriously considering Michigan. But with Gerard, you know, he's six foot three. He's a lot bigger than his brother. He's 265 already. I think right now Michigan likes him to where he's going to be a defensive end, like a big defensive end, but eventually he's going to slide inside. I can't I can't foresee him staying on defensive end. I think he's going to slide inside. And he's a guy, personally right now, watching his film and looking at his measurables, he reminds me of a bigger, faster George Rooks. That's how I look at him. Um, you know, George was a top 247 prospect coming out of high school too. He was six foot four, two sixty, basically the same. But I, I think Gerard's got a extra burst and a, an, another step to you know his game, and I think he's a little stronger at this point of his development as well. So excellent pickup. I know he had offers like you said, Sam from Alabama, Georgia, Notre Dame, bunch of schools. So he had the pick of his letter, and um, really nice pickup from Mike Elston, who is quietly putting a get together a nice defensive line class, yeah, by the is. way. Yeah, he is. Yeah, Steve, this one, this is one that low-key, I, I think this was kind of a, a chain reaction because suddenly it felt like Notre Dame started pushing Bryce Young a lot harder because you remember Michigan offered, and then it, you know, he – it started creating a little bit of buzz. Notre Dame, I think, was always kind of considered the favorite. But is that Boop? Is that Boop the cat? <laughs> Knew there'd be some cat interference today. I didn't think it'd be her tail hanging over the screen like that. But uh, go on, you weirdo. <laughs> right? Uh, so, um, yeah, if you listen to the podcast, it's, it's, uh, the cat's tail is well, uh, waving on the screen. So cat say hello. <laughs> anyway, hey, look, look, the cat's Lions fan. She's my no, she, She's ready. She's ready for the draft tonight. Yeah. She's waiting for them to draft Michael Mayer in the first round after you made that after you just made that comment, Sam. Uh, 
shoot me right now. <laughs> um, anyway, um, yeah, it's kind of a chain reaction because they suddenly they started pushing Bryce Young and in turn um, Micah Gilbert real hard all of a sudden. And it that seemed like a sudden thing. Both of those guys were talking about taking officials, and then all of a sudden the officials were off. The word I got was they – they had been feeling pretty good about Gerard Smith, it sounds like, and suddenly they weren't. That was all about Michigan. Again, as uh, Bryce said, Mike Elston did a great job there, Steve. Yeah, so so Gerard's recruitment kind of inter- – I mean, Michigan just only offered him in January. Uh, Jacob Smith has had an offer. His twin brother, the one not, not verbally committed anywhere yet, uh, has had an offer from the staff for a really long time. And was a guy I think we've had listed at top target for months now um, among that group of edge guys that they've been putting in some time with. I remember uh, it was probably six or seven months ago reaching out to Jacob Smith. I think Michigan had stopped by his school and uh, asking him, you know, how are things with Michigan or whatever. And uh, his exact comment was that until Michigan offered his brother, uh, they were not going to be a school he was really going to give strong consideration to. Uh, so it, it's kind of an interesting dynamic now to see Gerard pick up the offer and commit uh, before Jacob makes any kind of decision, you know. And so, yeah, no, Smith or Gerard is a, a probably, yeah, I think the George Rooks comparison makes a lot of sense. Uh, he's not going to be your your nose at all. Uh, he's a guy I feel like they could probably shift, what, three to five probably. Not Not going to be an edge guy either. So, you know. Michigan's done well with those types of kids. Uh, another one, relatively quiet recruitment, right? Uh, Nebraska, Kentucky. I think Kentucky was another school because I think they're originally from the state of – I think the kids are originally from the state of Kentucky, correct? Yeah. Uh, so that's where there were a couple early Kentucky crystal balls in for both of the twins. Uh, that was the driver behind that. And then, yeah, Notre Dame looked to be in pole position a while. So, yeah, I mean – Elston goes from Michigan not being under consideration for either kid to offering Gerard Smith and picking up a commitment from him in a few months. I mean, that's, you know, obviously great recruiting from from his standpoint, uh, you know, and, and now it's really about you got to think they're in pretty good shape with his brother, too. Right. I mean, right. You, right? you got to think. Uh, so, we'll you know, we'll see there. And I know we're going to we're going to touch on that in a bit. But but either way, you uh, Michigan, honestly, the offensive line's gotten a lot of the attention, and Bryce did make it glad that Bryce made the point that uh, this defensive line class looks like it could be very, very strong as well uh, when all is said and done. So, yeah, Dry gives you some versatility. I asked Don, who's seen him, uh, and good piece from Brian talking to him about his decision to commit to Michigan really highlighted the the uh, the relationship aspect of things like we've been talking about. But as a player, he said, you know, he sees a lot of inside outside versatility and sees the frame for him to play at 290 potentially so it really depends on how his his body grows i you know you see them listed as his brother is the edge in the in the mix you know three to five like steve said three if if he winds up being around 290 and brian seemed to think he really could now if he if that winds up being the case now you're looking at more chris jenkins like you know and and so from his his get off to his his technique. He said he's a technician with his hands, his power. So all those would would translate to playing on the inside if his if his body continues to grow in that way. I don't see that happening with his brother. I see his brother definitely being an edge uh, down the line. But this is this gives them some flexibility because suddenly you know Michigan is looking good with a bunch of edges. You got linebackers that. You know, you could have coming off the edge. I mean, you need some guys that who, who uh, frame wise could project uh, playing elsewhere on the defensive line. If it comes to it, I think this is one of those guys. Let's flip back to the offensive side of the ball, though. And the last of the commits to react to uh, the one that we were waiting on for this for this uh, edition of the podcast. And got to start with Steve because you were the first one to say, hey, I'm really looking quick crystal ball with this young man, Jake Guinera, the latest old lineman in the fold for the Maize and Blue. Yep. So Michigan center for the cycle. I think that's the the thing. Of course, there's a natural inclination for, for some to immediately uh, look at the rankings and ratings. I think he's an 87 or an 88 and wonder, well, they're in on all these four-star 
tackles, tackle guard types? Why are they taking a, you know, why not move one of the other guys to center, uh, like a Blake Frazier or something like this guy that can play center maybe. But uh, Michigan has had their eye on taking a pure center the entire cycle. I think it came down to, a, what, a trio, trio of names with Walt Claire Flynn, uh, Kyle Altooner out of good counsel is another guy I think they looked at as a pure center, but then Guarnera, who it became, it seemed to start to become pretty clear late winter, probably like February, March, that that he was the top guy for Michigan at that center spot. And uh, again, I, I think with a couple of these guys, Blake Frazier probably being the best example. These guys made it, they did a very good job of hiding what school it felt like they were really leaning towards, towards the end a little bit. Uh, I know when I think it was uh, when Ben Roebuck committed, uh, Guarnera actually FaceTimed with Ben Roebuck to congratulate him. Uh, you know, and I'm like, a kid from Florida FaceTiming a kid from Ohio to congratulate. Like, That's a little pretty, in, pretty good inclination that uh, Michigan's in pretty good shape there. So yeah, they beat out Florida, uh, Penn State. I think other school that was was involved in that one as well. So um, yeah, again, Michigan is just. They're dominating up front. I, I think that Guarnera, not just the guy they took, but I think he was the guy they liked the most of those the previously mentioned center targets. Um, you know, just adds to what is going to probably be maybe their best. I don't know. There's always that 13 cycle that none of those guys, I don't think any of those guys like panned out, maybe Kugler a little bit, but all those guys are really highly ranked, the, the Chris Fox, Kyle Bosch class. But this may end up being their most productive offensive line class ever because it just feels like the – Michigan is clicking on all cylinders. The evals are really good. They're getting guys, um, you know, but they're getting guys that not not just like eval, sneaky evals, but they're also starting to mix in a lot of their top, top type targets. So, uh, yeah, Guarnera, great addition. And now really the question up front is who's going to fill that last? We feel like there's going to be well, – they're going to take, take one more guy for sure. A lot of possibilities, it seems like, who could fill that spot. So I think that's going to be uh, – as, as great as they are up front – it's actually for Michigan fans. You should be just relaxed and let it play out now because they're no matter what. Even if they didn't sign another guy, this is an amazing offensive line class. This is almost like a luxury. The six guy is almost like a luxury. I think people just chill out and just see how it plays out and see who they get. Because I think it, it could be uh, very interesting to see how it ends up. Uh, the irony is, Steve, you were the first to talk about putting in a crystal ball. I think Bryce might have been the first one to actually. Do it. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I held off on it. Yeah, I should. <laughs> I should have put one in then. <laughs> Screwed up. But Bryce, uh, you you went with it uh, again. <clears throat> won't excite the fans, but the centers and the guys on MGO blog made a great point about this uh, during the roundtable session. Said so typically, what you see uh, in a lot of high school programs is you know the guys that wind up being college centers. A lot of times are high school outside guys, like like tackles, for instance, really good athletes that they're like, hey, we aren't going to put that guy in center. You can get away with having uh, a lesser guy in, in center of high school because he's going to be double teaming a lot anyway, right? Well, you get to college, though, and if if there is a pure center guy that they identify, man, especially if it comes from Sharon Moore, I, you got to feel like you got yourself a dude, a high IQ quarterback in the middle of that line. That's what they got with Jake Ranera. Yeah, the, the the thing with Jake, he's six foot four and two hundred eighty five pounds. He plays offensive tackle for his high school, and when you watch him, he pulls quite a bit. So you watch Michigan how they use the center, like Olu. He was pulling quite a bit too. It's not like Olu sat hiked and just sat there. Like he would, he was moving around, you know. And I think that's a good point that you have to have a guy. He's got a high football IQ. He comes from a family that his father played at Rutgers, so they know the game. He's uh he's been in Michigan several times, and again, like you said, if Sharon Moore approves this take, I, who am I to say this is a bad take? Mm. You know, I think obviously he knows what to look for an offensive lineman. This guy's nasty. He's got a physical streak. He's got an athletic build. He's a three sport athlete. You know, he's a district qualifier in the shot put. He's a basketball player. He's a guy that's still building on his frame. There's a lot to like about him. And like Steve said, cheering top of all of this is Sharon at this point can basically recruit for that last spot. And it's not like he's working to fill a class. He's just got to fill one spot if he wants to at that point. 
So it, it takes a lot off his plate going forward, which could help towards, like Sam, you said, other recruitments if he chooses to help with. Yeah, which I think I highly anticipate that being the case. Uh, you know, it's hard for the scouts, harder for the scouts to take, to really make that projection. Like, uh, you know, we were just talking about high school tackle. Is this a guy that it will translate really well to the center position? I think you got to really defer. Now, he's rated as a center, but they haven't seen him as a center. So how, how, do, they, how do they really sort of make that, that assessment? That's why I say, I always say, you know, look, the coaches aren't 100%, but, you know, they, they especially when it comes to offensive line, I think you're like, okay, just defer. Just defer, uh, especially when you look at the bloodlines and you consider this guy, his IQ and who Sharon is identifying to be his center, that should go a long way uh, with you and in, in the value, how much you value this commit from Jake Guarnera. All right, so now the question becomes, fellas, who's next? That's what everyone wants to know. Who should we look for as they get towards late spring and then get into the summer and June officials? Who do we think are the best bets to add to Michigan's haul here in the 2024 cycle? Steve, uh, you went with an obvious one a minute ago. I mean, you got Gerard Smith in the mix when is the last time and i think you just said it happened recently uh but the last time twins were wound up at, at different schools it just seems like an unlikely scenario that that would be the case here yep so yeah jacob smith uh you know yeah uh it was just last cycle the harris twins out of florida but you're right sam i think that's got to be like the only, one of the only times that that's ever happened uh you know and and jacob smith same top six as Gerard, Jacob Smith, to be fair, prioritized by Michigan earlier and more vigorously for a long time, right, until Michigan offered, and then they're both top target type guys. But uh, position of need, they still need edge guys. We think they're going to get a few, but they I don't know. Do they have a pure edge yet in this cycle? I don't even think they do. Um, you know, so lots of reasons why, uh, lots of success in that area. I mean, there's just so many reasons why there's. it'd be kind of hard to almost imagine at this point uh, that Jacob Smith would not end up in Michigan's class at some point. Uh, but given we don't know a, a timetable, you know, he could be the, you know, for all we know, he could be the very next guy or he could be the the fifth guy on the, right. on the, li- right. I mean, so that's, but, but, but just because of all those factors, you have to include him in a potential what's next type scenario, just because there are so many uh, major factors going in Michigan's direction now. Yeah. I, I want to throw Channing Goodwin uh, in there. Legacy guy. Michigan uh, went on him very early in the process. He's the he was actually the plug to Jaden Davis and all of the Providence Day guys. Uh, his dad being a former teammate of Ron Bellamy's, uh, he has shown himself to be a good prospect in his own right. So normally, when you talk about you know linemen, their kids are normally linemen, uh, and that's not the case with with Channing. But you can see there's a physicality to his play. Is why a lot of people. Uh, thought he could be uh, a college safety, uh, but has really developed himself as a route runner. He's a legit four or five guy. Uh, he is a contested catch guy. He is a great chemistry with Jaden Davis guy. Uh, has a really, really good offer list. But the number of times he's been to Michigan, it is in his blood, his dad, his uncle, the connection with Bellamy, the connection with Jaden. I just, I see it being very unlikely that a school is able to beat Michigan out for Channing, Bryce. So I, we all have crystal balls in for him. You were the first, Bryce, though, to put in a crystal ball for a guy. I know you're you're going to say is on this this list is a Marion Stewart now out of Kenwood Academy in Illinois. Yeah, four star wide receiver, recently transferred. Um, he's been up to campus several times. Sam, his father's a um a Fab Five super fan. You know, he's he's huge. And then Amarian himself, he's also got a connection with Jay Davis. You talk about Channing, he's got a connection as well. So a lot of, uh, and then on top of all that, his connection or his rapport with the coaching staff, especially Ron Bellamy, is super, super strong. So I like where Michigan sits with him. I think we all have a crystal ball in for him. I might be wrong, but. No, I, I recently put one in. I know. 
uh, Michigan Lightfoot <coughs> Academy, also to see Marquise Lightfoot. So that that's that can maybe help you, you know, kind of regain some ground in that recruitment where Michigan is obviously in chase mode with Marquise Lightfoot. He's leaning uh, elsewhere, but Michigan's still very much in the mix. Jesse Minner and and um, Mike Elston were in the school recently. And so, you know, the coaching staff there said it was reiterated to them that Lightfoot is a top target and priority, another edge, right? Uh, but Amarion, you know, it, this is another one where, you know, the rankings don't line up with how Michigan valued him. So we just talked about that with Guanera. With Amarion Stewart, and you guys remember this, he came to the barbecue at the Big House camp last year. And coming out of that, it was abundantly clear that he was at the top, at or near the top of their list of receiver targets. So, you know, the rankings don't say uh, what kind of prospect he is for Michigan. Michigan, Steve, and you, we've kind of talked, they, this is like their guy in this class. Not to say that there are other really good receiver targets, but Omarion Stewart is clearly the guy in this class for them. Yep, we think he's underrated. Um and to be fair, I don't think we've said that about every every guy that they're recruiting that's not a four-star, right? And he's one we've been saying it, I think, before he, we even got the idea that he was a Michigan lean. Uh, Alan, I'm sure we'll get a good look at him again before the process is over, but explosive. Um, a guy that, yeah, uh, I think what, Sam, the way you put it when he was on the on campus for the barbecue, right? They put him with all the top guys. Yep. Clear as day that he's a major, major priority for them. And, uh, yeah, Michigan continues to recruit that Chico- that greater Chicago area uh, mostly really, really, really well. Uh, you mentioned Lightfoot is still a top target. They're probably not going to get Justin Scott, but uh, they've done really well in Illinois. Actually, real quick, I, I you know, Michigan put out a ton of 2025 offers uh, this week. There are seven four-star uh, defensive linemen in the state of Illinois for the 2025 cycle. So we are going to be probably talking a lot about Illinois uh, for the foreseeable future because I can't imagine. I think Michigan's offered six of those kids too. Uh, you know, so it's an area that we're going to be uh, continuing to talk about a lot. But uh, you know, get, yeah, but getting Stewart in the fold, yeah, you're getting one of your top guys at receiver, right? Um, maybe, maybe like Fred Moore last year. I, th- I think Stewart had a little more of a dynamic profile as far as he had some. Some really big offers, some really big schools going after him. I think more, maybe a little bit more of an under the radar type, but but similar in that Michigan's made each of those guys that they made them a top priority early and uh, reeled them in. So yeah, put themselves in a great position at, at the at the outset. They kind of had to hold off what Tennessee was involved for a while and some others, but uh, provided they finish the job here, uh, you know, be another really good early eval and finish uh, on a guy that they identified as a top target. Uh, right away yeah they have to the charge is finishing with Aaron Childs right Aaron Childs very clearly as you guys heard on this podcast his dad say yeah he wanted to commit on that his last visit like we had to slow him down and be like hey let's do our due diligence let's take these visits but then he added Michigan is going to be the last visit before he makes his decision so you love that if you're Michigan you got a chance to counter Everything everyone else has said to try to overcome your lead uh, and that the final taste that he'll have in his mouth before he makes this decision is Michigan. This this just because Michigan been leading for a while, you should not lose how big a land this will be, guys. And I think we all have crystal balls in for for Aaron, right, Aaron to to Michigan. And I haven't seen anyone kind of dispute that to this point. Seems like a consensus at this point, Bryce, that Michigan is the big leader for Aaron Childs, the linebacker out of good counsel in uh, in Maryland. Yeah, and I, I would I just want to add on top of that, Chris Partridge, man. I mean, George Hilo did a great job with his recruitment to start off with, but you know, when you go from one person to another, sometimes recruitments can fall through the cracks or you just they just don't like that recruiter as much. But that hasn't been the case at all with Chris Partridge. He's picked up this recruitment. And kind of intensified it to the point where now we feel even more better that usually when a kid says he wants to commit, but does not commit, you kind of are like, ah, is he gonna is he gonna come back and really commit? But I personally, even if he takes these visits, which he's planning to, I don't have any 
I guess, issues with him coming back and thinking, uh, you know, will he? Get... I just feel at this point, if his recruitment, regardless of visits, Michigan's easily the team to beat because of what Chris Partridge has done going forward. And CP came in. So Aaron Childs, that recruitment was already pretty far along because, as you stated, George had done a great job with Aaron. He had done a great job with the family. So definitely want to give George his his credit and his props there. Jeremiah Beasley, on the other hand, uh, he was leaning elsewhere. Uh, At one point, he was leaning into Michigan State. At one point, he was leading to Penn State. At one point, he was leaning to Tennessee. Michigan had ground to make up there. And if he had made his decision early in the cycle, like he had initially planned, it would not have been to Michigan. But he decided to delay it. He's going to make his decision at the end of June now after he takes his officials. But in this window, in this time in between, Michigan has done a fantastic job of growing that relationship. They've gotten him on campus multiple times. They really like Chris Partridge. And I think Michigan leads for Jeremiah Beasley right now. Clearly you do, Steve, because you've already thrown in a crystal ball. Yep. So Beasley, a recruitment, I think we talk about Hilo setting the table in the Aaron Childs situation. Uh, Beasley is one that Partridge, yeah, kind of came in right away and, and made Jeremiah Beasley pretty much the top priority, honestly, at, at linebacker for the 24th cycle, uh, along with Childs, I think. Uh, you know, but but Beasley got the bulk of the attention right away because, like you said, Michigan was already in good shape with Childs. Uh, it was really about kind of Michigan or uh, Childs feeling comfortable, him and his his family feeling comfortable with Partridge. As long as they did that, it felt like Michigan was still going to be in good shape there. With Beasley, yeah, Partridge had to kind of come in and uh, sort of not rebuild, but well, just build maybe because uh, I don't really know how hard Michigan was recruiting him uh, until Partridge took the job. So. Yeah, I mean, in-state guy, in-state four-star guy, uh, you'd be theoretically taking him from Michigan State, who who led the crystal ball for a while. Uh, I know Tennessee, Penn State, other schools involved there. But, yeah, no, a guy that, you know, we're getting to the point with a lot of positions where it's, it's really feeling like Michigan is getting, you know, if you're Michigan, of course, you want like a Sammy Brown or a, a Raylan Wilson last cycle. Like those guys are, you're not going to get those. It's hard to finish the job on those guys, right? But you got, you want, you're still got, you got four or five top targets at every position. It feels like Michigan's getting two or three of those guys at most of the spots, uh, you know, at least at this point so far. And Beasley would fit that mold as far as, again, when Partridge comes in, you're seeing the the linebacker board was totally revamped from what it was before. Uh, and Beasley immediately became one of those top two or three guys that he was recruiting. So, yeah, a Belleville win, which, you know, I think that that's still a thing. I think for Mich- for fans on our board, at least, that's a big deal. So, uh, you know, but more importantly, getting a guy that they may have been able to get in the first place but almost let it sort of slide away, uh, you know, the partridge comes in and, and seals the deal. Yeah, I gotta you gotta give CP a ton of credit because I, I just don't sense that he was a big time target on George's board. I mean, it's a the the only reason why they even had a chance is because of the relationship with with Clint, you know, and Clint keeping that recruitment alive. So when CP comes in and says, "I really like this guy," okay, at least you have something to go on, you know. Otherwise, they wouldn't have had a shot to even build the relationship, but CP came in right away, right away saying, you are a guy that I want to get in with. And so he was on campus very shortly after that and the relationship between those, uh, that family and CP has been building ever since. So that's the benefit of a, of a Chris Partridge, of a, of a clean scale of a, you go back to Grant Newsom, um, you know, obviously Kirk Campbell, who we talked about a ton. You would look at Mike Hart with Jordan Marshall. Uh, Jay Harbaugh, who we're going to talk about coming up here with Gatlin Bear. I mean, Sharon Moore. Yeah, you made this point last week, Bryce. I mean, Mike Elston, who we highlighted in this in this podcast. Ron Bellamy, who we talked about in this podcast. Relationship builders from top to bottom on this staff. They have made a massive adjustment from the last recruiting site. This is just one of the adjustments they made from last recruiting cycle to this one. We'll touch on that on the other side, but we'll start out talking about Gatlin Bear. 
the freakazoid, freak of nature guy out of Burley, Idaho, 10 one 800 meter. He beat Nick Carver. He beat Rod Pleasant. He is the fastest high school player in the country. And Michigan is one of the top teams on his, his list, and they might be the team to beat. Talked to his coach recently. Let you hear what he had to say about Michigan and why they are where they are in his recruitment. When we come back on the other side on the Michigan Recruiting Insider. And we are back, folks, here on the Michigan Recruiting Insider. So before we uh, react and talk about Gatlin Bears' top five, here is an excerpt from a conversation with Cameron Anderson, which started out, the coach at Burley, started out a, as a conversation for background on Colston Loveland. He was Colston's coach over at Gooding, and we just had a sit-down with Colston for Behind the Uniform, so be on the lookout for that. It's a great episode. Uh, and then he started talking about Gatlin Bear. So here's that part of the conversation. So I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you real quick about Gatlin. We throw around the word freak on a yearly basis. Every, every year there is a guy who just looks unbelievable. Last year it was Nick Harbour with, you know, 10 to 800 meter at 235 pounds of 6'5". And then around, <laughs> Gatlin comes around this year, beats Harbour and Pleasant in the 100 meter. And mm -hmm. he has the new freak tag. So, I, man, I don't know what you're – what you're doing? <laughs> I don't know what you're doing not, to land on these guys, man. But whatever it is, you got to spread some of it around. Yeah, just just blessed, man. Again, Gatlin is a product of of his own work and and his and his father's ability to to understand how to. I mean, his his family is probably the most athletic family in the history of the state of Idaho. His his older brother is on a full ride track scholarship at Mississippi State. And he got off his mission and his first meet is a true freshman. He finished second in the decathlon. Wow. Like, like he just ran it. He just ran a 10, like 10, three, four, like, and, and then, um, and he's bigger than Gallon. And, uh, and then the other brothers are going to be on a full ride track scholarship to Arkansas. And the little sister is an eighth grader and she's the number one rated track athlete in the nation. Like she's just, wow. that, that family is just different. And, you know, Gatlin, it's always coach Bellamy got to see him, um, you know, for the first time walking by in the hall and it's stunning how big he, I mean, he's six, three, he's six, three, almost 200 pounds. So, um, to, to be that size and move at a 10, one, eight, 10, one, eight, man, like, <laughs> <laughs> like that, that makes him, that makes him the fastest, fastest foot. Like he's in the top five fastest football players in the world. Right. Like, there's only about four or five NFL guys that have put better times up than him in the hundred. So, um, it, it, it's, we just been super blessed. And, and like I said, the one parallel you can draw between those two guys is th that's on them. Like they just have a different work ethic, a different mindset and, and are built differently than, than other humans are. So, especially in the state of Idaho. And so, and he does not want to run track in college. No. Wow. Wow. Nope. In fact, he's not, it's kind of heartbreaking for his dad because he's not even going to run track his senior year. You know, wow. he's his, his goal. That's why he didn't play basketball. This, he was also the number one rated basketball player in the state of Idaho. So Gatlin was the number one rated basketball, football, and track athlete in the state of Idaho in the class of 24. And, um, and he led his team to a state basketball championship as a sophomore. He didn't play as a junior because he wanted to be healthy to break all the track records as a junior because he knew he wasn't going to run when he was a senior. Okay, so, great. Yeah, this kid is this kid is a different different animal. Good like grief. Good he's grief. a he's a he's a twenty three year old seventeen year old. Like that's that's just the way I put it. Like his mindset is just crazy. So what class is he gonna is he gonna be in? Is it gonna be twenty six or twenty five? So he'll be he'll be considered a class of twenty four signee, mm -hmm. but he but he wouldn't be on campus until um till like early enrollees in the class of 26 would be on campus gotcha 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 and that's so, that's what that's his plan he's he's gonna leave on his mission most most kids leave on their mission at the end of their senior year and and so when they get back they got to get into shape and then and most of them end up redshirting but gatlin's actually leaving on his mission in january when he would go to spring ball so when he gets back, he'll have a full winter conditioning and wow. spring practice with wherever he signs. Wow. Okay, man, man. Yeah, he's he's got it mapped out. So as far as recruiting is is concerned, you, you drew some parallels between he and, and, and Colston. First of all, you have that perspective being around Colston's recruitment. Does he talk to Colston at all? Have you connected the, those two? Do they know each other? Oh, sure. Yeah, they – 
they actually played against each other in high school. Um, so I, I was at Gooding with Colston and now I'm at Burley. So this was my first year at Burley. I, I moved to a different school and, um, and our arch rival was Kimberly. Like he played for the got the team that was our arch rival. And so I coached against Gatlin a couple of times and then, um, and then I moved to Burley and then his family ended up moving to Burley. So I ended up coaching him. So, um, I've seen him from both perspectives. I've had to defend against him and got to coach him and they knew each other. They met a couple times on the field, nothing big, but they have communicated since then. But, um, I would guess that, uh, Colston will be one of the guys that hosts him when he goes on his official. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. No doubt. So, I mean, factors in, in his recruitment and, and you know, what is Michigan doing? Right. Where do they, where do you think they kind of stand with him at this point? Uh, so I would say with Gatlin's, you know, if you look at his top five, his top five is a little odd for people too. I mean, his top five is, I mean, he, he got offered by Georgia. He got offered by, he's going to get offered by Alabama soon. Um, he, he got offered by any, everybody in the country. In fact, there were people, schools that were major schools that called and offered him. And he just said, no, thanks because he just knows he's not going to live in that place. So his top five is Michigan, Nebraska, Oregon, Boise state, and TCU, which is with all those big offers, right. they're all takes. That was who he landed on. And if you look at his, like what Michigan's done really well is um, Gatlin is very focused on his future. And he knows already that he's going to be a kinesiology major and, and, and his, he wants to be like a personal trainer for division one athletes and open up a business with his brothers where one of them's handling like the, um, the nutrition side, he's handling like the speed and strength and conditioning side. Like that's how driven and focused this dude is. And, and so, um, he knows, he knows that Michigan has one of the top, like, like their strength and conditioning coach is the highest paid strength and conditioning coach in the nation. Right. And the way that they, and the way that they develop athletes is above and beyond what others are doing right now. So, um, I would say their capacity and their, their facilities and their ability to train and develop. And, and he's looking at what's happened to the Colston. He gets to see that live. He knows what he looked like when he left. He knows what he looks like now because he's seen him in both situations. He knows that that's a situation where he's going to be developed. Um, and then coach Bellamy has just done an amazing job of, you know, um, he knew, he knew Jay in the beginning and then they handed it over to coach Bellamy and coach Bellamy has just done an amazing job of building that relationship. So um, not to mention he can, he sees that last night Michigan's class is now the number one in the nation and all they're missing is a wide receiver. Like he, he knows, he knows that. And um, uh, so I would see, he sees that as an, the, the, the schools that are in top five all have something in common. He can see a path to his goals through that institution. And, and Michigan has done a great job of portraying how they could do that. And so guys, there you have it. It's very clear that a lot of what made Michigan resonate with Colston Loveland, Steve, is making them resonate with with Gatlin Bear. I mean, you see all the big timers come in, and then you look at his list, and you don't see Bama. Like you, you don't see those. Uh, you see Michigan, of course, but it's not like just because Bama came in, uh, you know, similar to with with Colston or any of these other SEC powers. They come in. They he doesn't automatically fall all over himself to include them in his top five. He's going with the guys or the programs that he has the best relationships with. Michigan is clearly one of them. So that fresh Idaho air, you know, must keep keep the mind a little clearer, uh, you know, and when making their uh, decisions or whatever. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, Michigan elite football program, but we've always kind of said Michigan is different than those schools down south, right? So like this is what a time when it can actually benefit them that it's not all the bells and whistles type stuff that, that draw a lot of, or that push a lot of kids to some of those other schools, uh, mostly down South. So yeah, bear, uh, you know, Michigan so close with Kenyon city last cycle would, we'd be talking about them really three, four star guys, but also three like freak athletes out of the state of Idaho in a row. Uh, you know, if they were, if they can finish on Gatlin Bear, also, but either way, Michigan's been. They signed Colson Loveland. They probably finished second to Oregon for Sadiq, and we we feel like they're right up there with Gatlin Bear as well. Uh, yeah, Jay Harbaugh, kind of the uh, the potato guy. You know, like the, 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 the. I'm sorry, Jay. 
I did. Did I start out? I did say Jay. I was about to say, did I leave yeah, Jay think, off? No, I think. Yeah, I think yeah, you did. No, I yeah, that. no. Um, the guy that's kind of kickstarted this Idaho situation a little bit. You know, when they found Colston, I think they started to like at least take uh, not take Idaho more seriously, but at least keep a closer eye out. Ask more. Ask around a little bit more about some guys. You know, because when they offered Kenyon Sadiq, he was nowhere near where he finished being ranked at. I think he was an 85 or an 86 type three star. I think he ended as a top 100 or really close. Uh, Gatlin, I think, was a what a four star the majority of the cycle. I want to say already, and he's he skyrocketed in our last update. I know, I don't know if you guys agree. Feels like Brandon Huffman kind of wants to give him a fifth star eventually. It really it. I, I, right. It feels like he I could tell. I mean, he bumped him all the way to 40th. And I'm like, yeah, that's a guy that they want to keep moving up if they like what they see uh, in the next few months or so. So, you know, yeah, I mean, proof also that the Michigan brand uh, travels. Right. Uh, you know, because, again, Idaho, it's like, you know, not a surprise that a kid would go to Oregon from there. You know, like some of those Pac-12 type schools. But, you know, yeah, Michigan is in all of these races that they've put themselves in Idaho. And, yeah, Bear, I think you mentioned, Sam, not to steal your thunder here, but but more of a football player, like you said, than Harbor maybe was on the surface. And a guy that, you know, he can go on a mission for two years and come in and, and potentially just be a, be a guy right away for them. Um, yeah, f- football is his priority to make the, the comparison. You know, Nick's... Nick's sort of uh, priorities are are divided. Like he he's coming in and he's just like in high school, he's doing football and track. Gatlin's not even doing track his senior year in high school. So forgetting the fact that he's not going to do track at Mich- uh, not, not Mich- track in college, he's not doing it his final year in high school. Got football is his thing, and that is a key difference here, uh, Bryce. But one similarity to draw back to Colston is you have Cameron Anderson there as the coach. And that is a great plug for Michigan in this recruitment. Yeah, that's uh Michigan fans might be familiar with. I went down and I actually saw Colston playing high school and he, that was his high school coach. Now he's coaching Gallon bear over at Burley um, high school, but this recruitment, I mean, you Steve always talks about, well, you know, stuff kind of going wrong in recruitments like Gerard Smith committing, but not his brother. You know, like only Michigan would have one brother commit, but not the other right away. Right. But this is one where it's setting up nicely for Michigan, where if they could pull this one out, you talk about, you know, people ask me on the board, can Michigan land any more five stars? It's a good chance that I think one, if I had to predict today, I think Michigan would land him. But two, I think he ends up as a five star. Those are both my predictions. Looking at him, he's a freak of nature. I and the biggest thing with me looking at him is it's tough to evaluate because they say competition Idaho is not the greatest, right? But you look at Colston and you look at how he's just he's just a freak of nature as well. And then you talk to his coach who has a pretty good track record. And he's a good eye for talent. I'm gonna take his you know recommendation on a kid like this and what he's shown on the track as well. He's got the speed just to back it up. And, you know, people might be concerned about him going on a mission, especially, you know, I've seen people mention to me about, well, what about Andrew Gentry? And maybe that slowed his development. Well, he's off the lineman. It's a little different when it's a wide receiver. You know what I mean? I think that's a, you know, apples to oranges comparison, but this is a guy that Michigan can land, you know, Two years down the road, 2026 class, man, you that, that's an instant day, maybe not day one, but pretty quickly soon talent you can use to your disposal. And I think that's a guy that can help you in so many ways. Yeah, you know, the gentry thing, I, I, I get it, but you're right. It's, it's apples and oranges. And even among offensive linemen, I mean, you, you think about what they say. It's like he hadn't really passed set in high school. So he, there's an aspect of his – game that really needs to be developed not just not just to return to form whereas with Gatlin Bear it's just going to be a matter I mean it, <laughs> like you know they could have scored 100 points in a game last year uh one of the things that uh that uh, uh coach Anderson was saying like they throw him a lot of balls he gets a lot of action uh the speed 
translates, he's going to be an early enrollee in the 26 class. So it won't be like he's coming in in the fall and has to get ready. He'll have all the winter conditioning. He'll have all the spring ball to learn the playbook. Then he'll have summer conditioning before he even gets to fall camp. It sets up to be to put him in position to really hit the ground running coming off of his mission. So uh, that would be a, an amazing pickup for Michigan if they can pull it off. Boy, that's a that's just uh, and I didn't even mention this. I guess I should have mentioned this top five. I know Coach Anderson did there in that piece, but just think about this. I mean, you got all these big timers that have offered him, like Georgia. You know, Miami's coming in with the offer, AM, Texas is offered, right? You got all those schools coming in, and you look at his top five. Michigan sticks out. Michigan, Oregon's in there, of course, but Nebraska, TCU, Boise State, that's his top five. No disrespect intended to all those schools. TCU obviously beat Michigan in the playoff. But as far as profile is concerned, if he were if he were driven by that, you see Georgia in there, right? You see Florida in there. Those schools would make his top five guaranteed if that's what this was about. Texas and Texas A&M would be in there. And they're not. Uh, I think that is a huge sign that Michigan on the relationship side of things has done a fantastic job. So, look, I know we were going to talk about the uh, the impact of the the official visit change where kids can take uh, as many official visits as they want. Well, let's let's table that one for the next podcast, because I want to revisit a topic that we went into last year, guys. And we asked an open question in one of these podcasts because things were not going well, frankly, on the recruiting trail. Michigan was not experiencing momentum coming off the playoff appearance, right, for a variety of reasons. You know, Jim and the the Vikings dalliance went a long time, right? You had both coordinators leave, right? There was uncertainty on the staff. They, you know, certainly didn't have the number. You remember we were talking about Dante Moore and they had, you know, you got a spring game where Colin Kaepernick is going to be there, and they don't get Colin, they don't get Dante Moore on. You know, things like that were just happening all over the place, and so it there was an open question when you add NIL to the mix, and how teams were definitely doing a pay for play thing. Could Michigan be a top ten recruiting class consistently, or you know, would we would we have to you know have fans adjust their expect, expectations? and say they would get 11 to 25 more typically. You know, what would what would be the, the verdict? And if it wound up finishing outside the top 25, what changes would they have to make? Well, Steve, they wound up finishing with the 17th or 18th recruiting class in the country. That's factoring in the transfers. And so th- for them to be top five in this era, and they're number one right now, there had to be some some meaningful adjustments And we've seen them, Steve. I mean, you got to give this staff a ton of credit. They didn't just rest on their laurels. They went out and made some impactful changes to in this recruiting cycle. And we're seeing the dividends of them right now. Yeah, it feels like they've I think the biggest thing we talked about before getting on was the the, just getting guys up, Uh, getting their elite targets up and and getting them up maybe even like more often as well. one thing we know since Jim's been there is it's never been an issue of when they get kids to campus, they usually do really, really well. Uh, we rarely hear stories of like visits that went awry or or that Michigan didn't impress or give the the kid and their family more to think about, right? So like, so you get guys up more, you get them to that point more often. You're gonna put yourself, uh, not just put yourself in races, but you're gonna put yourself in a pos- better position in those races. Uh, also, they just feel like a stronger, and we've talked about this a few times, uh, just a stronger staff from top to bottom oh with God. guys, right? Uh, you talk about, I was just kind of bouncing this around in my head that uh, with the success they've had in Ohio, you talk about Beasley, you even talk about Bryce Underwood in 2025. I mean, does it kind of feel like that Steve Klinkscale might sort of be the unsung hero slash MVP-ish guy of the cycle for them so far, just because, not only is he getting guy, and he hasn't maybe even gotten the guy that he might get either, but you know, it's the it's he's sort of been the glue in a lot of ways that has sort of held some things together for 
the the rest of the staff to to either get guys or like I said get you know like the Bryce Underwood thing we talked about they were dead in the water there but it was his persistence that got them back up to campus to meet Kirk Campbell and now Michigan is at least still being considered in that recruitment a lot more than they were when uh when Matt Weiss was here so you know that's the biggest thing I think is is getting guys they've always evaled really well right they've always a lot of their earlier offers are guys that end up panning out like that type of stuff it's just a matter of not just getting them to campus but uh you know good organized visits I don't I don't think and I think Bryce would agree that you've mentioned this a couple of times I do think the group of kids they have committed right now have also been a big help in in sort of building that public keyword public camaraderie you know because I think it gets the fans involved it gets the kid the kid the kids you know you, you they now have elite commitments like Jaden Davis Jordan Marshall who are publicly st- stumping for Michigan with a bunch of top guys it's been a while since they've kind of had that thing going that type of deal going in their favor as well so some different factors yeah we've had a lot to think a lot less about what type of topics we're going to talk about uh you know when we go to record because there's so many different possibilities and just a lot of good good things coming out uh this winter and spring yeah bryce uh you know it'd be very easy to, for them to say oh we went to the playoff again just you know just keep doing what we're doing it'll it'll get better but that again that didn't happen now some of it was was born of of necessity uh you had to move on from from matt weiss but sometimes you fall up the stairs right and they fell up the stairs in, in grabbing Kirk Campbell, uh, who is a night and day, night and day difference as recruiters, which turns out being a big part of the domino effect. They were able to get their QB1 in early in part because they landed a relationship. guy. So this is the one recruit that Matt Weiss did a great job with, right? You don't want to squander that you wound up not squandering it because you got a great relationship builder in Kirk Campbell in the mix. And then you take a good recruiter in George Hilo and go to a great recruiter in Chris Partridge. They fortified their staff in a way that is reaping tangible dividends on the trail. I said this last podcast and I'm going to say it again. I think this is the top or the best class Jim Harbaugh's had in terms of recruiting standpoint. I mean, from top to bottom, I don't think you could find one hole on staff where you're like, we, you know, we got to carry this. He's almost like dead weight. This, you know, we got to help this guy out because he's not the greatest recruiter. I don't see that. And every person you turn to, I mean, you you mentioned people at Bash Mike Hart. Well, then he lands top 100 running back, Jordan Marshall. And no, on top of that. People that bash Mike Hart. I mean, so I guess, I guess some people did. Well, uh, I, I'm saying, you know, and on top of that, he's – got Michigan in position for Taylor Tatum, who's another top 100 running back that I think Michigan sits in great shape for. He just released his top seven as well. The the fusion they have from the recruiters on staff to develop, developmental, you know, coaching, just coaching prowess is night and day. You know, I mean, you look at example, DJ Turner, okay? Chris Partridge was the guy that landed DJ Turner. Sure was. Who coached him, though, right? Yeah. Steve Klinkscale, yeah. who Steve mentioned. And now there's a possibility tonight we might see him go in the first round. That is stuff you can show guys and really resonate because at the end of the day, as much as they want to, you know, win championships and be, you know, help Michigan, you know, raise another banner, they're trying to get to the league. They're trying to get paid as well. And these are things that you can show guys that, one, We can identify and we have great relationships. We're a great staff. But two, even if we, even if you are a three star like he was, we can development you, help you, rise you to the point where you could potentially be a first round pick like DJ Turner. And so I think with that, I think NIL, that's gone better better from where it was. And on top of that, too, the Jim Harbaugh rumors, that was always a big thing. And at this point, I feel like Jim Harbaugh has stated that if the NFL comes calling him in this next offseason, he's going to answer, you know. But all the guys that you've talked to, Sam, even on behind the uh, uniform, they've pointed out that we're going to do what we are going to do. We're not faced by it. And I think as much as you've seen other programs maybe use that as negative recruitment, 
it's almost kind of worn its its lots of shine. You know, you can only use that so much to at that point you're like everyone already knows it. You're not you're not surprising anyone with that. So yeah, yeah I think Jim is maybe settled into a groove of like look, he he said he's gonna pick up the phone, or, you know, period. But this cycle he handled it quickly. Like it wasn't this long drawn out process. And that was instrumental in turning in, in he was very intentional. Once he figured it out, let me get on the, on the phone with the top guys and let them know this is what's going on. This is what I'm thinking. I'm going to be in Michigan. This is where I want to be. This is where I plan to be. Now, circumstances kind of can change around you, but I'm giving you what my intention is right now. That That was a meaningful difference between this year and last year. Steve talked about getting guys up. I, Look, as a staff, collectively, you can shout out the recruiting staff, whoever, however they came together, they figured out a way to get more guys up and to get guys up, to your point, Steve, multiple times. It has been a huge part of what's going on here. You have the added benefit of you beating Ohio State and been to the playoff in back-to-back years, so teams can't say that's a fluke. The footprint emphasis. We, I remember us having podcasts about them recruiting Ohio and would they emphasize it more? They have, right? And it's not, you know, Clink is doing his thing in Ohio on a higher level and other coaches, we saw Mike go in, the, in there and get Jordan Marshall. Ohio recruiting is a thing for Michigan now. I was talking to the coach at Springfield, Mo Douglas, which is Aaron Scott, the number one player in the state. Mo, who sent several players to Michigan. His comment to me was, the boys are back in town, talking about Michigan. Right. It, they're relevant again in Ohio. So the footprint emphasis is another big key acquisition or key change uh, for them, expanding on what they were doing in Illinois. They're more active in Pennsylvania. Now we'll see what that what dividends that reaps. We talked about the addition of of Partridge and 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 Kirk Campbell. And lastly, you know, hey man, when you look around and you see the recruiting class be a really, really big and tangible factor in bringing guys in and the quarterback already being in the mix. What did he tweet? He said, uh, they asked and we delivered. You got your quarterback. You get your quarterback in the class, it can really help get other guys in the fold. And that's happened here. It's happening moving forward. I think Michigan is going to finish with a top five class. Reiterating what I said before, not number one, not number one, because as you said, Steve, these other teams are going to come in and they get their five-star barrages down the stretch. But I think Michigan's going to have staying power in the top five. We'll close out kind of getting you guys' take on that. Start with you, Bryce. You think you think Michigan has enough staying power for the top five, or do you think it's, it's going to be top ten? I had said, I think when we did this a couple of podcasts ago, I said top five, and you guys were like, eh, you know, oh, there's always – you, 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 you rattled off Texas a and You rattled right, off some I got, of these I got to go back and see. I could have sworn I said top five, but we'll see. I Check the know. tape. Check All the right. tape. But I, I'm, I'm going to stick with top five, and I think at worst, at worst, top seven. I mean, there's guys. The, here's the other thing about this too, right? There's guys in this class that are going to get rankings bumps. That's going to help their, yeah. you know, where they sit. Like Emmanuel Beagle is not going to be ranked. I think right now he's in 600. like 600. <laughs> right. Right. He's not, he's not going to end up as the number 600 overall player in the country. So I think you're going to see guys not top it. I think they're going to close with several more guys. We mentioned five. I think there's several more that you could also add to that list as well. And that's why I think it's going to be from top five, but at worst seven. Steve, uh, I can't remember what you said. And, and to be clear, he was at, he's actually closer to 700 than 600, Manuel Beagle. He's 687 in the there country. There you go. There he's you not going to finish at number 687, Steve. No. So factor in him getting the ratings bump and Michigan <laughs> holding on to him. Do you think Michigan has the staying power to finish in the top five, or do you think it'll be top ten? I'm still torn just because of the, the surge you're going to see from some of these other programs. So we know Georgia will probably finish ahead of Michigan. Their average recruit is almost ranked at 95 right now. And they have 11 kids, Ohio state, 93 average with 12 commits. They'll, they'll be up there. Um, 
you know, you're seeing, I'm, I'm just looking for the, like Oregon's always a possible South Carolina's recruiting way over their head right now. Uh, you know, so, but Michigan, even with Beagle and um, I believe Ludwig is an 84 or 85, uh, Michigan has a nearly 92 average per commitment, which is much better than they've had the last few cycles. And they're still in on a lot of other guys, I think, that are ranked there or above. So I, I, I think top five is still a very real possibility for sure. The other big key and the big factor that should be, listen, keyword should be in Michigan's favor, is that they should have another really good year this year. And that always helps, obviously, when you're trying to close, right? So let's say they win 11 or 12 games again in, tw- in this this upcoming season. Then I think that top five, top three becomes a real conversation just because at that point you're talking 30, what, 34, 35 wins in three years, 36 wins in three years, whatever, just theoretically. But, you know, winning has always allowed schools to close strong. We've seen Michigan has put themselves in, in striking distance or good position with a lot of guys. But that the difference when you're when you're winning that many games, it can reopen some of those doors that may have been closed earlier in the process, right? So I think that'll be something to watch uh, as far as where they finish. But with a 92 average, they're, they'll definitely be right in the mix uh, for a top five, top six class for sure. Yeah. Well, great stuff as always, fellas. We will talk about the impact of this official visit rule change uh, in the next Recruiting Insider, along with a lot of, I mean, you got official visits being set up, so much uh, recruiting news out there. So look for that discussion, though, in the next Recruiting Insider. Of course, you can always follow us over on the MichiganInsider.com. That's where it all goes down. That's the best way to show your love to TMI and what we do. Uh, you get the latest and greatest in football and our basketball recruiting. You get access to all of the sites on the 24-7 Sports Network, which is second to none, our national analyst, second to none. Of course, if you become a full pay member after that one month trial, you'll also get access to Paramount Plus. So, folks, great bang for your buck over at the MichiganInsider.com. Of course, if you like this podcast and you're listening to us uh, on the podcast, be sure to like it, be sure to rate it and review it and tell all your friends about it. If you're watching us on YouTube, like the videos, subscribe to the channel, help us grow and go. And we'll see you next time on the next edition of the Michigan Recruiting Insider. Thank <laughs> you.